and also a welcome from us. Uh, so we are very uh, humble to be the first session of the day. Uh, so we are all from Linux Integration Engineering. And when I knew that the topic for this DevConf would be cloud and hyperscale, so I couldn't resist and invite these awesome engineers who work on fascinating projects to have a panel discussion and talk about how we are doing hybrid cloud. Uh, and actually, when we started planning for this, we first had to think on what hybrid cloud actually is. So we had to look it up on the internet, find a precise definition to be on the uh, same page. So it was quite an experience for us. Uh, so let's start with introduction. Ondra, please introduce yourself. So hello, uh, I am Ondra, and I am working as an engineer at the Image Builder project in uh, Red Hat. And yeah, I'm one of uh, those people in our team who are, who are not afraid of touching ops, so I'm here. So I can tell you something about our operations. And if you are wondering what is Image Builder, it's uh, a tool for building and uploading uh, images. Uh, primarily currently that, that's cloud images, but we can do also ISOs, uh, containers, and much more, I think. Uh, and we are doing it for RHEL, for CentOS Stream, and also for Fedora. Uh, and uh, we have uh, basically <coughs> two big uh, operations thing going on. And one of them is our uh, nice CI that uh, runs like hundreds of jobs to, uh, every day to uh, test that we are building the right thing. And then we have also our production service that's online and uh, every one of you can try it. So basically you need to go to console.reader.com, uh, then go to insights and image builder and you can build your own customized uh, RHEL image, Fedora, Im Fedora image is not there yet. <laughs> uh, but will be, will be, uh, definitely. And send to a stream and uh, it's just the best way how to get a cloud image of our stuff. So feel free to try it. And let's go to Michael. Thank you. Uh, I'm Michael. I'm uh, part of the CKI team and responsible for infrastructure there. And CKI stands for Continuous Kernel Integration. So we are providing kernel testing as a service. So independent of what other people say, the kernel is actually tested. So we are providing <laughs> testing for, for upstream, uh, integrating into the awesome uh, email-based workflow of the upstream kernel developer community. Um, and we're also providing testing for internal Red Hat kernel developers that are nowadays living on gitlab.com uh, in merge requests and kind of like treating the kernel as a kind of normal software project. And so CKI does uh, everything you would expect from a CI project for a software project. Um, we are running builds for the kernel for multiple architectures. Um, we are testing them in, in labs uh, inside of, of Red Hat mostly. And then we are also looking at the results of those tests trying to detect new issues to alert kernel developers about them and trying to figure out what to do with those new issues. Because as the kernel is a bit special, still it means that you might have issues that you know about but you can't immediately fix. So that's, that's what, where we are kind of like working on the workflow uh, and improving it, making that possible. Okay, thank you, Michael. Okay, hi, I'm Pavel. I'm an engineer and uh, team lead in Copper. Uh, team, uh, we are working on the copper build system, uh, on the underlying mock utility, and several other, let's say, packagers, uh, maintainers, software maintainers oriented stuff. Uh, the copper build system is a tool for building uh, third party RPM repositories on top of, like integrated on top of Fedora and the Red Hat Enterprise Linux and other distributions. And by integrated, I mean it's super trivial to build with us, you just get the account, you create the project, and you can build. Uh, uh, but it's also like very easy to consume the content from us. So, like you just hit the command DNF copper enable and the name of the project, and you can start installation. Uh, thanks to um, thanks to our sponsors, cloud sponsors, we have like quite some power nowadays. We we run even over as thirty uh, three hundred uh, VMs in parallel today, and we could even scale more if we need it. And uh, as such, it's like kind of expected and desired uh, you to use us for continuous builds and uh, for, uh, for stuff like builds RPMs in, RP, uh, in uh, pull requests and so on. Either using our webhook support or for example, the packet, packet service. I checked today and we have like 17 terabytes of package data. So it's, yeah. Wow, that's impressive. Thank you, Pavel. Nothing like having notes in front of you and not saying what I wanted to say. 
I think I did not introduce myself, so I'm Tomáš, I also work for Red Hat. Uh, and you probably see the schedule and there were four people and suddenly there's three. So actually Miro Vatkerti got sick and c cannot be with us. So maybe he's watching. Hi Miro. Uh, and please get well. We need you. Uh, okay, so we should probably speak about how you are working on your applications. So let's deep dive into clouds. I mean fly up to the clouds. So please describe like uh, what infrastructure do you use and like if it was VMs or containers, uh, maybe. Can we start with Pavel with you? Yeah, uh, yeah we have two coppers. One is public, one is internal for Red Hat purposes. And I would like to talk about the Fedora copper one uh, because that's much more interesting. So everything is public. Uh, we don't use some private stuff uh, in our lab. Uh, we have uh, on-premise machines in the Fedora infrastructure lab where we run a libvirt. Uh, we have we, we run uh, machines in AWS spot instances and on demand instances, just in case something something gets wrong. Uh, we use uh, IBM Cloud uh, for S390. Uh, we use uh, Oregon State University for PowerPC or Little NDN. And yeah, we, we start VMs using a separate like tool uh, from the copper copper code, uh, some resource allocator which divides our VMs into pools. And those pools are kind of homogeneous sets of builders, always dedicated to one infrastructure. And each VM in that system is tagged using like architecture tags. So when, when a copper or, I mean, user or even the copper build system comes and wants to use, uh, let's say, S390 machine, uh, it says so using the tag and it gets, it gets the machine either immediately or after some time when it gets like allocated. So like for saving the budget, uh, we like allocate certain amount of VMs in advance so people don't have to wait till we allocate them. And we allocate more if there is demand for them. There's also like prioritizing between pools. Like we try, try to use the VMs we have in our on-premise lab because we already paid for it. So, <laughs> so why, uh, why, why to use cloud? And then we fall back to other pools like uh, IBM, uh, I mean, AWS spot, and then we go to the on-demand one because they are simply more expensive. Yeah. Starting, stopping takes some time, so we try to recycle VMs, but it's not, it's kind of like tricky because uh, building RPMs is, is a privileged operation. Not, not the building itself, but uh, for building RPMs, you need to install other RPMs as build dependencies, and for that, you need to be a root. So, we kind of give full powers to those VMs to all of our users. And as I said, anyone can build in Copper, and it would be kind of dangerous if, if we allowed to hack users on each other. So we, re uh, we recycle if it is absolutely like safe for the same users in the same projects, but otherwise we shut down the machines as uh, absolutely normally. Like we start every day like thousands of machines, maybe tens of thousands today. Okay, thank you, Pavel. So please don't try to hack other users. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it shouldn't be possible, <laughs> hopefully. Okay, Michael, please tell us uh, about that kernel CI that has to be also pretty interesting to work on. So, so yeah, we are also using uh, uh, hybrid resources, both cloud resources and uh, on-premise resources, trying to kind of split this depending on the properties of those environments. So if you have um, cloud environments like AWS uh, or GCP, you have highly reliable infrastructure managed professionally, um, which can more or less endlessly scale, or that's at least what, what you would expect. Um, so that's, that's what we also use cloud resources for, so really stuff that, that needs to be stable. We have an OpenShift cluster running there that hosts our microservices. Um, we have a messaging cluster running in AWS because that's, that's uh, based on VMs, a very stable environment. Mm, we are using l lambdas uh, as webhooks, uh, really having basically only three megabytes of code as, as, as the stuff that can break and no VMs in the middle. Um, and then we are also using obviously cloud resources for anything that needs to scale. So if you're building kernels that might be 
no build job running when all kernel developers are asleep and then at four at night basically they they actually uh, have their productive times and then you're sp spinning like hundreds of them right um, so that's that's only possible if you go to a hyperscaler to do in a in a responsible fashion otherwise you might starve other teams of resources um, we are using on-premise resources um, for other reasons so for example if you need interesting architectures like uh, IBM S390X, PowerPC, then you might have cloud providers that can give them to you, but it's actually a bit harder to, to use them and the copper, copper team does, but we don't, so we are falling back on, on local machines for those. Um, the same goes for the testing aspect of the kernel, so if you're testing the RDMA support, you need an RDMA lab, you need special hardware, so that's something that you will only find on premise because you kind of build it yourself. Um, and then the third reason for doing stuff locally is again the cost factor where you might have a workload that is long running and it's actually pretty beefy so you need big machines and they would be really expensive to actually rent from somebody like AWS or, or GCP. Um, so it, it, it depends and we're trying to be both cost effective and like mindful of our customers that expect a stable service. Okay, thank you, Michael. Please, Andrea, tell us about Image Builder. So, um, as I told you, Image Builder is a hosted service uh, that uh, you can just call the API or visit the uh, visit the front end and just build an image. And yeah, that's a customer-facing uh, 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 service, and uh, it just needs to be high available. There needs to be zero time redeployment, so it just must work for all of you if you want to build an image. And so uh, we need to use something stable, which is uh, OpenShift, you know, uh, running uh, multiple containers just to, uh, just in case if, if something fails to have uh, redundancy. Um, and uh, we run it in, in AWS because that's what our uh, SRE team supports. And uh, the sad part of this story is that currently you just uh, cannot build uh, an image uh, in a container for various reasons like it would, be, it would have to be privileged and opened. Uh, you would need to open a lot of paths to it. So it's just uh, it's just not possible currently. So also uh, we are uh, running a pool of uh, machines in AWS, and uh, they are doing the actual work lifting. So uh, already it's kind of non-standard situation, and we will talk about it later, hopefully. Right? <laughs> I hope yeah. so. <laughs> we have time. So. Um, yeah, that's it. And our uh, CI is also uh, very interesting because uh, we are running a lot of machines and we would like to run most of the stuff in AWS because it's just, you know, hyper hyperscaler, you can run as, as much stuff as you want. Uh, but we need also to test these images. And so we need virtualization. And in EC2, it's very hard to have, uh, to, uh, to have virtualization. There's an option, but it's extremely pricey. Uh, so we are, don't want to go there. So instead, we are going hybrid and are using uh, local OpenStack. Uh, and then you need to solve all these issues to handle resources into clouds. And we use Terraform to abstract it. And it eats so much memory. So yeah, it's, <laughs> it's painful. <laughs> Okay, so next topic is not painful. Uh, you already said uh, OpenShift, so let's talk about OpenShift. So for those of you who don't know it, uh, it's it's an amazing product by Red Hat, Red, uh, like Red Hat OpenShift container platform. It's our flagship product to run containerized applications. And honestly, like even in our project, I can't imagine you would run it on anything else because it's just uh, saves so much time and everything. Uh, it's based on Kubernetes and uh, so let's hear it from the panelists, how they use OpenShift. Andrea, you have the mic, so you need to start. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, so yeah, uh, our production, uh, our basically the API layer is, is running uh, on OpenShift. And for us, I think it's, it's a success story uh, because uh, it does what it should do. Just it hosts the platform st uh, like in a stable manner. Even though the cluster under uh, the application is being upgraded, it just works. And yeah, uh, we have uh, like probes and metrics to, to measure everything. And so far, I think that we haven't uh, managed to broke production. So uh, that's pretty nice. Uh, but also, you did? Not yet. Not <laughs> <laughs> oh, not yet. Yeah, not yet. <laughs> I haven't ch ch checked Slack <laughs> in a long time. Anyway, uh, yeah. And uh, what did I want to say? <laughs> uh, 
Uh, I know. Uh, yeah, that it can be tricky. Uh, that's something to realize. Like it's an asynchronous big platform. It can contain I don't know how many nodes, and sometimes you need to be careful uh, about timing. Uh, basically, from our from uh, one of our our stories, uh, we were killing uh, the pods uh, while requests were still you know going to the spots, which you know lowered uh, the success rate quite a lot. <laughs> so yeah, it's it's not a great thing. So we need to. Uh, play with it for some time to understand all, these, each, uh, all of its concepts. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, so your application needs to be aware like how Kubernetes OpenShift works. So, okay, thank you. Uh, Michael, are you using OpenShift? Yeah, before production, right? <laughs> <coughs> yeah, so, so the CKI team, so we are running everything we can on, on Kubernetes and then by extension OpenShift, it, makes it, it kind of makes it consumable. And we try to run Kubernetes by ourselves, but um, it's it's far more involved um, after you know what the, all the pieces are that you need. So OpenShift kind of like really abstracts it away. Um, so, but then there are some limits what you can run on, on Kubernetes, for example. Uh, Kubernetes has some ideas of workloads coming out of, of what, what Google designed Borg for at the time, I suppose. So it has this idea that workloads can get killed and then you can re-spin them up again. It, it's stuff that can be parallelized. So, uh, we have, for example, long-running jobs that need to stay up for a couple of days. So that's not something that Kubernetes really was designed for, can deal with nicely. Um, so we keep those things out of Kubernetes. Um, we have um, other workloads that don't fit maybe the feature set, but they could be made to work. For example, we are using, we are building kernels. We need to support architectures like S390X, PowerPC, um, but a Kubernetes cluster normally is one architecture, so there are some limitations. If you if you want to build container images, you can't build them for S390X on an x86 Kubernetes cluster nowadays. Maybe that's that will be fixed. But so so we're hitting those limits, and then kind of like you always need to, yeah, then kind of like try to solve those problems outside of it. It might be more painful. It would be kind of nice if it would be on OpenShift, but it's it's not at the moment. Um, and then the third thing we are not putting on an OpenShift cluster is uh, stuff that needs to scale extensively, like build jobs, and that's what the Copper team similarly deals with. You you could scale a Kubernetes cluster to, by putting more nodes in them, and then you would put workloads on those nodes, but it, it's much easier to just spin a VM uh, in a hyperscaler directly and then run the workload directly on those machines. So that's uh, it's easier and more cost-effective and has less failure modes. So there we also, yeah, not go, not going Kubernetes all. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, and Pavel, can you tell us uh, about your OpenShift story? Uh, yeah, <laughs> uh, we are not using OpenShift yet, <laughs> and um, we are sometimes broke break the production, so maybe that's the reason. <laughs> but we certainly plan to use it. Like we already have a work in progress pull request for OpenShift deployments. And uh, there is yet another pull request from some guy from the outside uh, doing a customize for Kubernetes deployment. And uh, yeah, there are the, the question, how am I supposed to start my own RPM build system because I cannot use Fedora Copper One uh, because legal issues or because I have some proprietary stuff I need to build. Such, such questions come often and often. And it, I mean, moving to OpenShift without infra will not only like simplify our own work, but it will also like kind of connect us with our with the other folks doing the deployments. We will kind of like standardize it. So that's that's it. Yeah. Uh, uh, builders, builders are like the problem still. Like even if we are with the infra in OpenShift, we will still have to spawn VMs because we need to give our users full privi privileges, as, as I said. So with this case, I think in, I mean, uh, the OpenShift virtualization could like help us a bit, but still we need all the architectures. And even though we are using multiple clouds now, not, none of them is using uh, or providing all of the architectures we need. So likely the, the, the allocation part and the, the flexibility part will have to, will have to stay with us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. 
So uh, about the builders, Pavel, would it help you if OpenShift had support for username spaces? Yeah, definitely. Like to some extent, uh, it would not probably solve the the architecture point of view. But mm -hmm. uh, having username username spaces, uh, I mean, in the mock tool that mm -hmm. Copper is using, we already support uh, rootless username spaced containers, so you can run mock there, and it would like really like change the way the RPMs can be, be built. Like we could like move some of the stuff to containers that it would be really awesome. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. I hope we'll get there one day. <laughs> uh, okay, next topic. So we are still in the OpenShift area, uh, but we already heard like what works, what doesn't. So Michael, what's, what's missing for you in OpenShift? It's, it's mostly around the multiple architectures, I think. So um, we are not an application team, so we are providing CI pipelines. So that might not be the usual case, but I think I think we we three have similar issues that we want to provide support for multiple architectures out of a common infrastructure. And for us, for example, that means that we want to build uh, container images for mu for multiple architectures. And it's possible you can build a multi arch uh, image that's um, available in Docker or uh, Builder or whatever. And and the user doesn't really need to care about the architecture that that their machines have. They just Pull an image and it just works, but then actually producing those images is something that's that's harder to do. So I think there's there are still pieces missing of the multi art story, and it becomes interesting. I think also for customers that, for example, want to migrate, for example, to ARM machines or ARM clusters or something, then they they might have actually similar issues. That this migration story becomes really hard to implement in practice because you're stuck to the native architecture where you're building your application and actually moving that over is more painful than it needs to be. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So I, I'm glad that we have one panelist <laughs> who works on b building images. So Andra, w what's missing in OpenSheet for you? Uh, so sadly it's not uh, username spaces uh, <laughs> because uh, <laughs> we are currently in the way how kernel works, uh, we are uh, dependent on the kernel. So for example, nowadays it's not possible to, fit, uh, to build a Fedora properly on uh, RHEL because Fedora uses uh, a special file system. If you can, you know, uh, if you can guess the name, I will tell you where you can get cheap butter. <laughs> and yeah, uh, so for us it's basically support for virtualization and in our case we are running on AWS, so there is an option for using virtualization with OpenShift, it's called OpenShift Virtualization, or the upstream name is kubevirt, right? Uh, and uh, yeah, that would be nice, but you know, in AWS, if you want like virtualization, it's extremely, uh, it's extremely expensive. So in our case, if I can like dream, uh, it would be amazing if we can spawn EC2 instances as basically uh, pods. Like the lifecycle would be the same thing, and it would be just very nice to integrate it into the whole uh, Kubernetes workflow with you know transparent networking and things like this. But one can only dream for now, I guess. Now you need to file that uh, feature request. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. So, like you in the audience, how are you doing? Are we too technical? Are we boring you? Or because ne the next topic I would like to ask is deployment and testing. So, is it exciting for you? <laughs> okay, <laughs> so <laughs> so wonder how are you deploy and test uh, image builder? Okay, uh, so I can uh, talk more about the deploy uh, deployment. Uh, so our SRE team uh, made us a wonderful workflow for uh, GitOps. So we can just store all the configuration for our service in Git, and we can you know revert. They even run some tests on PR, so we know that it will break even before we, we deploy it, which is uh, very nice. And uh, yeah, it banishes both uh, the EC2 instances that we have using Terraform, probably, yeah, Terraform, and uh, the OpenShift parts is like a custom pipeline built on Tekton and Jenkins, I think. Uh, so uh, that works wonderfully, and uh, yeah. Uh, we do have a staging and production environment for uh, for the service, which is amazing. The only difference that uh, there is is that a stage is just uh, a small scale, like, I don't know, four times smaller. Uh, and uh, that's nice because if we ever had an issue somewhere, it uh, appeared in stage. And we just uh, 
fixed stage and everything was on track again. Uh, so that's nice. And also it's a rule for all of our production stuff, or yeah, all of them, is that we try to not have SSH keys there or, or like any access. So uh, if we want to know like in which uh, state the machine is, we need to have a look at logs or at, me or at metrics. And we push uh, all logs from all of our uh, services into one Splunk, uh, into one Splunk instance, and it's just uh, super nice that we can see everything there. No, oh, very nice. So, Michael, how about you? Deployment and testing and staging and production. Yeah, we don't have staging. We, we just break production. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, so yeah. So um, we we have we use GitOps as well. So everything is is somehow managed uh, either by having YAMLs that can de be deployed into OpenShift clusters, uh, Kubernetes clusters, and it's heavily templated to be able to abstract stuff like monitoring and logging. I think we are ended up at a similar setup as, so everybody is a platform engineer, I think, um, kind of like trying to come to a common layer that kind of encapsulates the common parts, um, especially if you're on microservices. Um, and then for all the rest, we use Ansible. So there are like bare metal machines, VMs in AWS, DNS zones that need to be updated and all for those kind of like miscellaneous things um, it's it's Ansible um, so yeah we had an architect that kind of like started doing these things and before he could get to Terraform he left for the image builder team so we are kind of stuck with Ansible and they got the cool stuff <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah and then uh, so uh, for, for testing we are mostly unit testing uh, on one level. We don't have a staging environment, uh, not because we, we don't know how to spin one up, but uh, it hasn't <laughs> up to now provided enough value to do it, so we have a partial one. But for most other things, we are because we are running kernel build pipelines, we, we, want to, we, we are going to change components of those pipelines when we are working on them. And so what we can do is spin up canary pipelines where we take a known good pipeline, basically a kernel revision that we built it and built and tested. And we can spin it uh, again, but now with updated components. So before we merge those things, so we kind of like replace these individual pieces and then look at it whether it still works right and still gives the same results as before. Um, and that, that actually works works very well. Um, but it's not that, that we consider that the all end. I think um, how we deploy is um, there, there are improvements we would like to do, uh, for example, around Kubernetes using something like OpenShift GitOps, Argo CD, like those consolidating things where you also actually check whatever you deploy is actually running in the cluster and that there's something that actually looks at it instead of just throwing it over the wall and hoping that it will all work out. Um, so that's one. The other aspect is that the way we manage secrets is okay, but uh, we have like I counted, was like 300 of them. Um, they're all nicely stored. Um, but then if somebody comes along and says like, oh, um, you got compromised, please rotate them in the next two hours. I mean, we don't even know where we got them. Right? <laughs> it's not, um, um, so, so the, the whole secret rotation, dynamic secrets, um, rotating on a schedule, rotating them, some, if somebody leaves on incidents, it's something that we are working on. So that's, there's, there's a lot of stuff uh, that needs to be done. Okay, thank you. So, Pavel, let's hear it from you. Uh, yeah. Uh, we also have production and development stack, uh, but still somehow happens that production goes down. I don't know <laughs> what, what we are doing. Uh, for development, no, no fancy GitOps, unfortunately. We, also already, oh, we only do uh, continuous builds and builds from PRs and uh, linting and stuff like that. Uh, for for like local development, we have a Podman Compose stuff, so we can run uh, locally the copper stack and test, develop, and so on. Yeah, so that would be it. One specific is like building the golden images, uh, because we cannot simply f we need those VMs to start very quickly. So so we cannot use simply uh, the images that Fedora provides because they are too old. We need to install there some. We need to update it, we need to install some software, configure it, and so on. And that would be simply take too, too long. Therefore, we built our own golden images, and they are based on the Fedora images, and we are doing it using Virtsys prep and, and tools around that, gluing it together with some of scripts, 
and they are very ugly. So, and you can you can you can imagine that supporting multiple clouds with golden images. It's uh, yeah, we are really looking for for the image builder support, but currently Fedora is not in scope with all the architectures that we need. So. <laughs> okay, okay. Thank you, Pavel. We we are actually slowly running out of time. We have about five minutes, so I can't imagine we would be doing this presentation with Miro as well. Like we would already run out out of time. So, final topic: uh, current challenges. You already you already spoke about some. So, do you have some more? Uh, yeah, I think I think moving to OpenShift will be one of them because like we are uh, three folks. Speaking of, of full timers, it's two and one quarter, and it's not too much. So we would like to like minimize the maintenance costs even more. So OpenShift should help us. We are looking forward to, for the image builder support and moving this to them. And uh, yeah, um, all the problems we are talking about are kind of similar. So maybe we could like take it as a challenge and organize something and do it together, solve the problem in a way. That will work for, for, for all of us. Yeah, like a panel discussion. <laughs> Actually, while we were preparing, like we already think on so much stuff that was amazing. Thank you, Pavel. <laughs> uh, Michael? Yeah, so, so the, the issues we see next to all the other stuff we already mentioned is, is around scaling. Um, so if, uh, introducing testing, uh, it, might initially be a problem because people don't like that, but then after a while they kind of like get into the mood and then stuff uh, starts to increase in scope and, and amount. And so if um, a service scales, it's, it depends on whether, if it's on-premise fast, then we, we are going, or we, we are hitting scaling issues where we hit resource limits of statically uh, allocated um, resources like a, like a testing lab for example that only has a certain amount of machines and if you throw more jobs in this direction at a certain moment that basically will not work out very well um, and on the other hand if you if you throw more jobs at a hyperscaler then the hyperscaler is kind of happy about it um, and they'll charge you for it so <laughs> there will be costs associated with scaling um, and it will expose and in our case it does expose then certain maybe assumptions that were not valid of what courses costs and how many costs and um, all the, those budgets you needed to formulate in the beginning of the fiscal year might actually um, exceed it quite easily. And so you kind of need to keep track of the costs that those, those scaling aspects actually cause and, and, and mitigate them. So that's, that's a continuous, let's say, battle of, of, of keeping track of it and, and, and working on it. So stay within budget. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah, so uh, I think that our uh, like upcoming ch main challenge is scaling our service uh, because we are currently using you know the shiny uh, auto scaling group in I, uh, in AWS, but we have the uh, size fixed at you know a certain amount of machines. So we need to move uh, as as we get more customers, we need to of course um, scale the service automatically. And yeah, this is like a challenge, a complete uh, new challenge for for a software engineer because you need to collect metrics. Uh, decide how, or like, on which metrics you will scale, how much, and then even somehow validate it before you uh, put it into production. Otherwise, you know, it may happen that you end up with zero uh, machines in production because you um, failed at making proper uh, script. So <laughs> yeah, uh, that's the big, ne the big next challenge, and uh, we'll see if maybe we can share some uh, some information about it. And I was even thinking that, uh, Pavel, you said that uh, that it would be nice to share information more. I was thinking during this talk that maybe organizers should deploy OpsConf <laughs> or something like this. And <laughs> operations, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, that's it from me. OK, thank you. So Honor says we are out of time. Uh, <laughs> so unfortunately, we can't take any questions right now. But, <laughs> well, <ever>. but, <laughs> but please reach out to panelists. And when you see them on DEF CONF, I'm pretty sure they'll be happy to talk to you. Uh, and thank you, panelists, for taking up the challenge and sitting here and talking about your experiences. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Please have a round of applause for our panelists. <laughs>